Assalamu alaikum. My name is Ramin Javadian, and I am a policy fellow for the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Alhamdulillah, I am so grateful to be joined by Luqman, Hidaya, and Medina here tonight in an effort to address and combat anti-Shiism in our communities and abroad. Before I introduce our devoted and passionate speakers, I would like to take a moment to give a brief overview as to why we are here tonight and to explain what capacity our speakers hold in sharing their insightful remarks. Our panel on dismantling anti-Shiism is an extension of a program first organized by San Diego-based nonprofit civil rights organization, Borderlands for Equity. This program also endorsed by the Shia Muslim Council and Islamic Center of Southern California is not to serve as a scholarly discussion apropos to various understandings and interpretations of the Islamic tradition. Rather, our panelists aim to share both their experiences in Shia and Sunni spaces that must be addressed as a whole and evidence-based research on systemic anti-Shiism. Questions are encouraged through the Zoom and Facebook live chats and may be answered by the end of the panelists' remarks. But we want to remind you all that the intent of your questions should come as a means for clarification to tackle misconceptions, create unity, and address the very real issue of anti-Shiism in our communities and abroad. So tonight, we are graced to first be joined by Lukman Bukhari. Lukman is a Pakistani student at Brown University studying public policy and South Asian studies. He is particularly interested in issues of decolonization and creating educational resources and opportunities for the communities he is a part of. He has experience working as an advocacy and legal fellow for Borderlands for Equity, a CLDP fellow in the US Senate and working as a refugee and working at refugee education NGO in Indonesia. Outside of school and work, Lukman enjoys learning languages, reading and writing poetry. Welcome Lukman. Next, we are blessed to have with us Hidaya Nawi. Hidaya is a student at Montgomery College, a writer, a speaker, and an activist whose work predominantly focuses on issues of race, gender, religion, and disability advocacy. She currently sits on the board and she currently sits on the board and executive committee of the awaited Imam Mahdi Edification Association, an organization focused on fostering the identities of Shia youth, particularly in the DC area. She also enjoys teaching at her local Sunday school. Last and certainly not least, we are joined by Medina Talabi. Medina is a junior at Drexel University, majoring in political science with a minor in war and society. She serves as a local community organizer in South Jersey and greater Philadelphia area, coordinating events to serve the needs of both first generation and newly immigrated families. Medina has also been teaching at her local Sunday school for the past six years. Currently, she is working on refining the manuscripts of her respective research projects focused on framings of political violence, geopolitical conflict, and human rights violations, as well as her contributions in her role as a research assistant for the project on Shiism and global affairs at Weatherhead Center at Harvard University. Now, without further ado, Lukman will be getting us started in addressing anti-Shiism by sharing how Sunnis can best hold their communities accountable to dispel rumors and hate speech against Shias. Um, thank you so much, Ramin, for that lovely introduction. Um, and thank you for putting this together. Um, thank you, MPAC, for hosting and also all the other co-sponsoring and affiliated organizations for supporting this initiative. Um, this conversation is really long overdue. And as are many of the conversations that are happening within our, within our communities. Um, but nevertheless, I'm incredibly grateful to have been invited to help shape this conversation on how we as Muslims, as Sunnis um, as well, um, can address uh, anti-Shiism in our communities. And inshallah, how we can best be better brethren to our Sunni, our, our Shia'i brothers and sisters. 
So I want to also reiterate, um, if it wasn't clear already, that yes, I am a Sunni and I am speaking on this panel because it is absolutely important that we as Sunnis acknowledge our role as accomplices in the fight to dismantle anti-Shiism. It is part of the very struggle that you know, we have to own and, and take on to ourselves and um, inshallah invest ourselves in. So in order to start this process, uh, we must understand that what we mean when we are talking about anti-Shiism. And so for the context of my remarks, I think we must look at anti-Shiism as a distancing or denial of a Shia Muslim's Islam and or their humanity. And usually the type of anti-Shia rhetoric that we see within our communities reflects some semblance of both of these strands. And I think this can be firmly be seen in the ways Sunnis often tend to car caricaturize Shia beliefs, practices, and communities. In terms of the common tropes that are often said, people often resort to saying, you know, things like Shias follow corrupt ayatollahs, they give blind allegiance to them, they beat themselves during Muharram. Um, I even remember this one time when an uncle in the community told me that Shias celebrate the killing of Uthman during Eid, uh, Eid al ghadir And so what we need to understand about such messages is that these are obviously first tropes that more than often do not, uh, more than often not, do not reflect the beliefs of Shia communities. But second, that these tropes and messages stem from a hatred of Shiites. Oftentimes these tropes are ones that originate from anti-Shiite rhetoric that is said in the Muslim world and has arisen out of unique socio-political and power uh, context and power dynamics that my fellow panelist Medina will further expound upon in her presentation. But these tropes, um, we must confront it head on, these tropes are directly meant to marginalize and otherize Shias, either pushing them out to a periphery of our understanding of Islam or out of the Islamic fold completely. And this is a problem and is something that we really need to push back against. However, we cannot fight back against something that we don't know anything about. A fundamental problem within our communities is our lack of knowledge on ourselves and our traditions. And this is a detriment because in dismantling anti-Shiism, we have to directly turn to our own systems of knowledge and traditions to affirm the necessity of attacking anti-Shiism. So in, in this, I urge my Sunni brothers and sisters, but I also urge all types of Muslims um, to do the work of learning your deen and your aqidah, which is theology, fiqh, jurisprudence, and the history of how these knowledge systems even came to be what they are today. Because having this knowledge makes it easier to then clearly dismiss parties trying to open up the question, are Shias Muslim? Or allegations that Shias are disbelievers. Because you could refer them to, for example, um, Aqidah at tahawiyya the creed of Imam at tahawi which was written in the classical era of the Islamic civilization by the Sunni scholar at tahawi And in this treatise, you can find clearly that the definition of a Muslim in his view is that we, um, and it, I'm quoting this right from, from the book, we call the people of our Qibla Muslims and believers as long as they acknowledge what the Prophet, may Allah bless him and grant him peace, brought and accept as true everything that he said and told us about. So very clearly here, you would see that given this definition, there is no need to argue whether Shias are Muslim or not. Or in fact, this is very flawed flawed and inflammatory question to ask in the first place. So I reiterate that knowledge is a crucial part of the work of dismantling anti-Shiism. And once we know it, we don't need to give credence to such questions or such hateful misguided rhetoric. Um, and then also having knowledge on these Islamic traditions, their history and its evolution, we are better equipped to understand that there is such a thing as plurality and diversity, even within the Islamic tradition. So to better explain this, I also will, I'm going to use an, an, um, an analogy that um, Sheikh Trenton Carl, um, mashallah, he's the resident and uh, resident scholar and co-founder of the Sacred Groups community in Chicago. And really, if you have any time, please check out their work. It's really amazing work. Um, but he once said that if we take a look at the conventional view of American history, the one we're taught in school textbooks, right? we might see one that shows us ideas of liberty, equality, democracy, revolutions, freedom, um, the ideology that led to independence from the tyrannical Britain. However, if you flip it around, and if you take a look at the black and indigenous view of American history, you will see 
um, the very uh, harsh reality of slavery, oppression, settler colonialism, and genocide that has occurred. And so ultimately, the way that a narrative is created, the way that a people create a narrative about themselves and embody it is, is ultimately a product of power. And so when we are first exposed to the way America views itself, it sticks and we're fine with it um, until that narrative clashes with another. And it takes an unlearning of our first narrative to accommodate the views of the second narrative. So now the point of this analogy is not to say that Sunniism is the oppressor and that Shiism is the oppressed, but rather I use it to show, well, in all sort of time zones, okay, but uh, in all, in a, and in all eras, but rather I use this analogy to show that even looking at the same facts, we can arrive at different conclusions. And this is not even necessarily talking about Sunni and Shi'i views of history, even though you could certainly extrapolate it to that. But rather, I'm trying to talk about the ways in which we view ourselves. As Sunnis, do we just have we in completely internalized the view that we are automatically correct and that nothing correct um, exists outside our worldview and that we are the dominant ones? And then when we look at Shi'as, we always look at them through a prism of having to prove their legitimacy as Muslims to us. This is what I'm trying to get at. So this is particularly important because oftentimes um, people come and in reaction to, for example, an MSA trying to be more inclusive to Shias, they say things like, by constantly emphasizing Shiism, you're pushing Sunnism into illegitimacy. And this is actually a real scenario that has happened to me. Um, the, and to this, I wanna respond is that the point of dismantling anti-Shiism is obviously, it, you know, dismantling anti-Shiism, we cannot um, equate it to uh, preferring or pushing down the Shia tradition of Islam on anyone. That is just horrendous to even think. But it is precisely a matter of moving away from the marginalization and otherization of Shia Muslims in Islam. And this underscores the need to understand acceptance and toleration. What truly demands acceptance um, and from which there can be no derogation is the humanity in Islam of Shia Muslims. And there is no derogation to it because it is firmly held and proven. But what exists within the realm of toleration is theological differences, jurisprudential differences, differences in practice and tradition. And these cannot be erased. No one is asking you to believe in the 12 Imams. No one is asking you that you participate in Muharram practices and no one is forcing you to partake in an Eid you don't feel is yours. What we do owe the practices we don't understand and the practices that aren't ours, our toleration, our respect and accommodation in our shared spaces and communities. So this means that in our MSAs, we must be asking ourselves, are we creating an environment in which Shia Muslims feel safe? Are we accommodating Shia practices for example, when Ashura comes around. And in our Muslim community organizations, and mashallah, I must give a shout out to MPAC um, for being you know, one of the you know, forefront leaders on this regard. Are we, making a directed, uh, are we making a dedicated effort to reach out to Shia communities? Are we hiring Shia Muslims? Are we working with Shia leaders? And the list goes on and on of the questions we can ask ourselves. One thing I actually just completely forgot is, do we feel like we are legislating uh, you know, for Shia Muslims, right? And this goes back to the earlier concept of the legitimacy. Are we, are we privileging our own selves, our own worldviews um, over others and using that to marginalize hatred or even incite violence against Shia Muslims, right? This is all very connected. So the list goes on and on, but uh, of questions we can ask ourselves, but that ethos needs to be there. There must always be some type of inward questioning going on as to who is in the room, who are we serving, and how can we make this better? So um, I wish to end my remarks with a verse from the Quran. Um, it is in Surah Ali Imran, uh, chapter three, verse 103. And it says, And it translates to, and hold firmly to the rope of Allah all together and do not become divided. And oftentimes this verse is used to silence Shia voices in the name of unity. But I want to emphasize that in order to not become divided, the goal we need to approach is a unity based in harmony and not conformity. Unity means justice. 
unity and unity requires justice, not even means it, it requires it. Unity means a firm compassion between brothers and sisters of Islam. And unity includes all of us such that when a part of us is hurting, all of us are. We can't have unity if we do not acknowledge the anti-Shiism that manifests in our communities and our society at large. And so the work we need to do on ourselves is essential. We need to be better at checking ourselves, evaluating the narratives we tell about ourselves, making space for the incorporation of Shia narratives and voices. And we need to be at the forefront of attacking the hateful and harmful entities and beliefs that impede Shia narratives and um, inclusion in our communities. There is no one way to do it. There is no one specific element to counter because we can have a three hour long panel on that. Um, yet we all have a role to play in ensuring we are holding ourselves, our families, and our, com uh, and our communities accountable and waking up every day to create that undivided community by holding firmly onto the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So with that, I conclude my remarks. Um, thank you so much for having me on. And I really look forward to uh, what the next panelists have to say. Jazakallah khairan. Wow, M mashallah, that's all I can say. Thank you so much, Lukman. I mean, you you touched on so many important aspects and I think you've opened up the door for especially the, the Sunni community to understand what they can better do. And just one thing that I wanna highlight, which I personally really took away from what you said was, we must decenter the single narrative of Islam. We must decenter this idea that Islam has to be practiced this one way uh, uh, as told by this one jurist um, for, for years. And that's something that just isn't true. We see historically, which I know Hidayah will be touching on in just a moment, that there, there is an influence of many different jurists when it comes to Islam. And, and each one has, has a, a unique perspective to tell, which should be acknowledged just as all the others. So thank you again so much, Lukman. Now I wanna hand it over to Hidaya, who will be speaking on how anti-Shiism manifests in Muslim religious spaces in the United States. Um, Salam alaikum everybody. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Uh, I'm a little bit technologically challenged, as my fellow panelists know, so please just bear with me one second here. Okay, there we go. Okay, so salamu alaikum, everybody. Thank you again so much for joining us and to MPAC also for creating the space for these conversations to be had. Now, as Ramin uh, so eloquently said, I'm going to inshallah be talking about what anti-Shiaism looks like in our sacred spaces. So massages, MSAs, Muslim organizations, um, things of that nature. So what I want to start with is by re-emphasizing um, something that Luqman said very eloquently and Ramin touched on as well, which is that we agree on all of the major things, right? We agree on the one God, we agree on the prophethood and messengership of a man named Muhammad, and we agree on the message, which is the Quran. I know that personally, uh, that last one is very controversial in some circles. Um, people have asked me to see the Shia Quran. Sorry, it doesn't exist, <laughs> you know? Uh, I think every Quran that I own came from Saudi Arabia or Pakistan. Um, which is really funny because, um, you know, those are two of the hardest countries in the world right now to be Shia. Um, but I, I want to also highlight the fact that what we, what we disagree on is the interpretation of a certain historical event, right? That's not to say that those events are not valid. That's not to say that they're not important. They're extremely important, right? And they're the bedrock of our identities, no matter what side uh, we fall on. So that's not to negate the importance, but I really want to make sure that we understand this, right? It's the history that's different. Um, and the other thing I want to say is that we have a lot of problems in our Muslim communities. There is rampant racism, there is rampant sexism, um, there is, you know, rampant anti Shiaism also, unfortunately. Um, Fun fact, if I come up with two more isms, I can win bingo because for some reason, you know, I fit into all of those three. 
um, in one way, shape or form. But yeah, and, and there's also in our spaces this idea that, you know, um, the, the one narrative is the only narrative. And that's also extremely dangerous. Um, as you know, in MSAs and in our massages, again, those are where we shape our identity, right? Those spaces are where I go to learn my Islam. But then it tends to become this majority ruled um, kind of space where if this is a predominantly Sunni space, then Shias are not welcome here, which is a problem, you know, or, or um, more accurately, I should say Shias do not feel welcome here, right? Because if, even if you don't go out of your way to make someone feel uncomfortable, there's also sometimes unwritten rules that make people who don't believe the same things you do feel uncomfortable in that space. And sometimes th the rules are written, you know, in more MSAs than one, which one, even one would be one too many. But I've, I've heard so many people say, um, I wasn't allowed to run for vice president of my MSA. I wasn't allowed to run for this position. Why? Because I'm Shia. And people sent me like a formal letter <laughs> Say, not just like, oh, we don't know. No, it was a formal letter from the heads of the MSA saying you can't be here um, in this capacity if you're a Shia, right? And also the burden of fixing this is, is never on the brutalized, right? The burden of fixing anything is not on the brutalized. It's on, um, you know, the burden of fixing sexism is not on women. The burden of fixing racism is not on Black people, right? It's on those people who are the majority. And in this conversation, the majority of Muslims in the world um, identify as Sunni. So leaders of entire communities need to do better about first educating themselves about Shiism, right? And then passing that education on to the mimbar. We need to look, you know, past this idea of the, the sheikh, the mufti, the imam, he's above question, right? The prophet himself, the one who brought us the message directly from God, was not above question. The Quran is riddled with verses that begin with yes alunaka, right? And for those of you who don't know, that translates to they asked you, right? Which means they asked you a question about this, here's the answer, Ya Rasulullah. Go give them the answer. So if the prophet who we all agree got the message directly from God himself is being asked questions, Riddle. then nobody else is above um, being asked questions. And respectfully, that includes the leaders of the MSAs, that includes the, um, the sheikhs who run the massages and, and you know, all of, all of the leaders in any capacity, those who enjoy the privileges in that space, they all have a collective responsibility to educate themselves on these issues. Now, I want you to take a minute and just read these. <laughs> Um, these are some of the things that either I have heard or experienced or some friends of mine have heard or experienced from MSAs and Muslim majority spaces. Now, these are appalling, right, for, for a number of reasons. Um, it being haram to mourn Imam Hussein salam is incorrect because we have hadiths both in Sunni and Shi'i books that said the Prophet himself cried for Imam al-Hussein That's not my opinion, that's fact, right? Um, and, and like I mentioned before, you know, you can't, you can't run for this or that position because you're Shia. You can't give this or that presentation because it would be too divisive. You can't read a dua, which was, was so interesting for me because we all believe that duas are things that we do to God, right? Um, this example mentions dua kumail specifically, which um, it, anybody who's ever read it, Dua Qubayl is a conversation between the servant and his Lord. That's all it is. There is no Imam mentioned in Dua Qubayl. It's just me asking God to forgive me. And she has read it every Thursday night. And for some reason, this particular MSA said no to that. But all of that comes from a sense of, I don't know it. So I'm afraid of it, right? I don't know it and I'm not going to go ask, which is the real problem, right? Because it's fine not to know, 
But remaining willfully ignorant, especially in this day and age where there are so many resources available to us, is, is unacceptable, um, frankly. And another example, I'm not sure if you all remember this, um, that happened recently is Aya Hashem was murdered in the UK. And anybody who heard that story was rightfully appalled. Um, and your heart went out to Aya Hashim and her family. She was a young woman who was an aspiring attorney, just like me. She had dreams and she had goals and her life was cut short. And Muslims, rightfully so, started a fundraiser in order to offset the cost of her funeral on her family. And when the organizer found out that she was Shia, they shut it down. Now, that's a problem for a lot of reasons. Um, on the level of humanity, it's a huge problem, right? Because it doesn't matter if, if I see a dog on the side of the road that, you know, tragically passes away, I'm going to want to make sure that that dog is buried, right? At least that would be the, the akhlaqi thing to do, right? But the reason it's even more of a problem is that as Muslims, in jurisprudential law, in every single book of Islamic law, it says that we Muslims of the world have a collective responsibility to bury any Muslim who passes away. And yes, I said any who passes away, right? That's our responsibility, we have to do that. And the only time that, that bur the burden of that responsibility is lifted is if one of us in the world takes it on and says, I'm going to do it, then that burden is lifted off the rest of us. But until and unless that happens, all of us have the responsibility of bearing her, right? And so think about, think about if um, God forbid this was you, right? And, you know, somebody rubs salt in the wounds of your family. This is, you know, is, is, is I'm, I'm, I'm going to say small, but not with the, you know, not in terms of the size, but this is a very, you know, um, this is a drop out of the ocean, I should say, of some of the problems that can arise. Because essentially what you're saying is that this girl who was murdered, who had her life cut shot, short, um, is, is not worthy of a proper burial, which is disgusting because, you know, we should be, um, anybody and everyone who passes away, we should, you know, take on the responsibility of making sure that they get a proper burial. That is the right of each and every human being. So what can we learn from this? Um, I think the main takeaway is that one, you can maintain a strong uh, Sunni or whatever it is, uh, whatever Id other identity you have without hating someone else, right? Um, the Prophet's entire mission was summarized in perfecting our akhlaq, right? And, um, you know, th the way that we do that is that we first start with looking at the humanity of, of people and then going from there. And also, we can't forget that a lot of our problems um, in the Muslim community are shared, right? Um, and the example that I always like to give is that the people who harass me because I wear hijab don't care that I'm Shia. They, they don't know and they don't care. But um, they, they're going to, you know, they, they just see Muslim. So if we are going to, um, if we're going to sort of um, help them, by making things even more difficult for ourselves internally, that's a huge um, thing, right? There, there's a lot that we can do to, to change this. Um, there, as I mentioned before, there's a, a fear of Shias even using Sunni majority spaces for our programming. We, like, it's not even something that comes to our mind. And why, right? If it's, um, if it's Muharram time, why should any group of Shias anywhere have to go and rent a hall to have Muharram Majalis when in most of the neighborhoods that I've ever been in in America, there is a mosque uh, within like every five mile radius, there's another mosque, right? 
there's no reason why I should go pay um, for a home when there's a perfectly, you know, um, you know, good method right there, right? But the fact that we don't even think of that. And again, like Imam Hussein is not just for me, you know, um, it, Imam Hussein is not just a Shia, uh, Shia concept. He's the grandson of the prophet that we all claim to love, right? So um, if it has something to do with him, then again, we all have the co collective responsibility of making sure that we mourn him the right way. And anti Shiaism also leads into kind of a misunderstanding of, of Islamic history for a lot of us. Because if you only know the Shia side of Islamic history, then you're missing out, you know, because th there's a whole other facet and, and the reverse is also true. The, the best way to live a rich um, experience um, in terms of being a, a, a well-rounded Muslim is to know all sides or as many sides as you can get your hands on um, of Islamic history. And also I think it's important to highlight that we have more in common then we do uh, differences. And the, the example I like to give for this is the foundation of the knowledge of all four founders of the Sunni schools of jurisprudence is Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, right? The sixth Imam of the Shia, all of them, Imam Malik, Imam Hanbal, Imam Shafi'i, Imam Abu Hanifa, all of them are taught by Imam Jafar al-Sadiq. Right. And there are still like there are a lot of people who do not know that. And that's a major problem. Right. And it's, it's what kind of leads to anti Shiaism. Right. Um, Imam Abu Hanifa says if it wasn't for the years that I spent with Jafar Sadiq, I would have perished spiritually. And that's a direct quote from him. Right. So if you if you follow Imam um, Abu Hanifa, and you don't know about Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, that's a huge problem, right? Um, so after all of this, what can we do? It's important to remember that the day-to-day -day microaggressions can snowball quickly, right? So the Shia's worship Ali narrative, for example, they have a different Quran is another example. These are all things that can very quickly turn into something that is very big. Because what, 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 what do I hear when I hear they worship Ali? That means they don't worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Or they do shirk, right? Which is another um, really big stereotype that we keep hearing. And, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you know, he has nothing to do with the people who commit shirk on the day of judgment, right? So if this is what you believe and this is what is coming to you through um, the mimbas or the videos that you're watching from some very prominent, you know, um, Sunni speak speakers and scholars, then that is going to lay the foundation for what happens globally, right? Um, when it comes to Shia genocide, which uh, my friend Medina will touch on in just a second, right? Are you as, as vocal about any of those things? Um, when it comes to Kashmir, when it comes to the Rohingya, um, when it comes to Palestine, we have sort of taken that um, and, and made it a part of our identity and, and rightfully so, right? But are we doing that for Shia genocide as well? Right, we we do the we go to Al Quds protests every year for um, the Palestinian cause. We boycott, you know, in, entire systems of government, you know, um, as a way of standing in solidarity with our um, uh, Palestinian brothers and sisters. Are we extending that same um, devotion to our Shia brothers and sisters? Because Shia genocide is real and it's happening. And if we don't fix um, the sort of quote unquote little things that we think we know um, and correct them and learn from uh, a knowledgeable Shia, and yes, the emphasis there is on knowledgeable. If you just 
pull a random um, kid from your college and ask him a bunch of questions he might not know. So it's important to find knowledgeable people in your community who are able to answer these questions for you so that we can get rid of this um, once and for all. And also the reason why this is so important is that if we don't fix this problem, um, you know, like I said, and um, Islamophobia is already a huge problem, right? And we need all kinds of allies in this fight. And, you know, when it comes to the issue of anti-Shiism, the biggest group that we need in this fight is the Sunni. So it's imperative that um, we all get, you know, educated as much as possible. Um, so anyway, thank you guys so much for listening. I'm sorry if I took uh, more time than was allotted to me. I was trying to talk really fast. So if anything is unclear, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, offline as well. Um, I'm going to inshallah turn it over to you, Ramin. Awesome. Thank you so much, Hidaya. I mean, you as well just touched on so many important things. And I want to remind everyone watching that this session is recorded and will be posted on the Impact YouTube and Facebook page after because there are some very, very important insights that Hidaya just shared, that Lukman shared earlier, and that Medina is about to share. And one of these aspects, Hidaya, that I just want to highlight one more time that you mentioned was the fact that, first of all, these experiences that are so important to just acknowledge that they exist, um, but also that the Islamophobes, they are at ease when we are dividing ourselves, especially over misconceptions and over ignorance. And that just, it's another reason why we have to act to actively marginalize any misconceptions that may be arising and anyone who is uh, who is just spreading these these horrific lies about uh, the Shia community. So I thank you again so much Hadaya and I think towards the end you also gave um, a really appropriate segue to Medina now who uh, will be offering a very important teaching on systemic anti-Shiism in some Muslim majority countries and Medina will also be addressing the very, very real issue of Shia genocide. So Medina, all yours now. Uh, amazing. Salam, everyone. Um, I first want to thank, you know, the organizers um, for putting this event together. And of course, my wonderful co-panelists um, for their amazing insights. Um, and you know, I agree with uh, all their earlier sentiments. I think these conversations are the first steps in the learning process. So I'm humbled to be speaking with you all about the topic of structural anti shiism in a broader global context. So let me just share my screen. Okay, and then we're gonna present. Amazing. Okay. So um, I've actually limited the presentation to more of a survey since this is a topic that you can really go into depth with, but if there's any further questions or if you're interested in the references, I'd be happy to talk about that or provide this as well. So with that, uh, we begin by asking ourselves what systemic or structural anti shiism actually is. While this pattern of violence and discriminatory behavior has been historically reported on and written about, it was only officially defined by Shia Right to Watch, a nonprofit NGO, in 2011 as the hatred of prejudice, discrimination, and or violence against Shia Muslims because of their religious beliefs, traditions, or cultural identity. And I break it down further into three different categories, all of which are completely like valid manifestations of systemic anti-Shiism, physical violence, discriminative policy, and cultural erasure. So physical violence in the form of kidnapping, torture, uh, target killings, massacres, bombings, ethnic cleansings, state-sanctioned executions and sexual, sexual violence, uh, discriminative policy, which often works through more um, institutionalized channels, such as governmental bans on the practice of Shiism, municipal orders to close Shia centers and masjids, limited work opportunity, intolerance in schools and apartheid, and finally, cultural erasure in the form of the destruction of, her of heritage sites and the suppression of Shia identity. So on the slide, I have some of the countries where anti-Shiism has been reported on. Um, the names of the parties that are guilty of violence and the motivation behind it that generally remains uh, the same with little variation from case to case. So for a quick rundown on, um, on some instances of anti-Shiism, uh, in Iraq, the Camp Spiker massacre where specifically Shia cadets were executed by ISIS. 
in Nigeria, where the government initiated a brutal crackdown on the Shia community led by Sheikh Sakzaki, which resulted in hundreds of peaceful protesters being killed, including six of his own sons. The target killing of Shia professionals in Pakistan and the abandonment of healthcare when anti-Shia doctors refused treatment to, to Shia patients. The extrajudicial execution of Sheikh Nimr in Saudi Arabia, along with many other Shias who are labeled as terrorists without much of a trial. Uh, the torture of primarily Shia protesters in Bahrain who were imprisoned in the wake of the 2011 uprisings. The fact that it is literally illegal to be Shia in Malaysia. The vandalism of Shia mosques in Birmingham in the UK. The attack on a maternity ward this past spring in a predominantly Shia populated area in Kabul, including Azoraz. Um, France's Minister of the Interior closing specifically Shia centers, campaigns to destroy Shia heritage sites in Syria, the use of advanced surveillance technology in the UAE to prevent Shia organizing, pogroms of, Tur of Shia's Turkey Alevi population, and finally the bombing of Shia centers in Kuwait. So now that we are aware of the overwhelming evidence proving anti-Shiism and know why it's important to address it, as my co-panelist put it, we ask, how can we understand it outside of these neo-Orientalist frameworks that have been constructed by Western media and academia? So we need to understand the limitations of the most commonly employed frameworks that are used to explain this kind of violence. First, Iran-Saudi rivalry, which I categorize under geopolitical tensions that these lives lost are just collateral damage in an attempt to accumulate power in these regions. This fails to explain anti-Shiism in majority Shia states and also doesn't really account for the fact that anti-Shia violence has been taking place since before the establishment of both of these nation states. Ideological alignment of armed groups and the weaponization of religious identity is the second framing and I know I wish this, there was a shorter way of phrasing it too. But this one, I think, comes up in a lot of interpersonal exchanges where people, either Sunni or Shia, will bring up the actions of armed groups as if they're like completely homogenous organizations with a uniform set of actors who are all motivated by the same thing. In reality, we know this to like not be true whatsoever. Like uh, armed groups within any specific country are all you know composed of people from different socioeconomic backgrounds, religions, and you know even sects. Um, and, the primor and the, finally, the primordial hatred between Sunnis and Shias in what is called sectarian conflict. And even though I just used it, I really don't like using the term sect um, because it has really colonialist underterm undertones and implications, which is honestly a topic for a whole other topic for another discussion. But really briefly, the term sect itself refers to an offshoot of the mainstream or religion that is perceived as orthodox whereas the sect is considered unorthodox and deviant. So this understanding and the way Shiism is, is introduced as a sect contributes to the idea that those who follow it are willfully misguided. But back to this frame of primordial hatred that honestly is used way more than you think, basically pits these two groups, like completely dismissing all the you know, diversity that exists within them against one another and says, you know what? They've always hated each other. That's how it's always been. and That's how it always will be. And we know this to be obviously false because throughout history, we know that they've existed not necessarily in conflict with one another, but in conversation, polemically and otherwise. And the main problems with these frameworks is that they fail to account for a number of things, including the ones I've already listed, but also the fact that the word conflict itself um, has this implication of the asymmetric nature of the violence. It insinuates that both groups are suffering equally where that we know on a transnational scale, this just isn't the case. So understanding it for what it is with all of its nuances, regardless for how much it complicates it, is crucial because being reductionist only further perpetuates cycles of violence. And while the, the Shia have faced systemic marginalization and violence, you need to look at it within every single national context in order to understand how it could also possibly be originated in indigenous and local grievances before chalking it up to these really elaborate explanations of international relations and regional dynamics. And just briefly on the, top, on, on the area within this topic that I'm researching myself, is the emergence of this movement led by Shia diaspora to reframe this violence as Shia genocide. So what I found in my interviews of different groups of stakeholders, including activists, religious leaders, academics, and average Shia people from or currently living in these countries, is the optimism of a humanitarian lens yielding more results than a sectarian one. So in the study, I identify the definition of genocide as outlined by the Genocide Con Convention of 1948. That's written here for you all to read. 
Um, and while it seems pretty straightforward, there's this wrench that's thrown into it that has been a huge obstacle for other diaspora groups who also try to reframe violence as genocide. So in order for violence to be considered genocide, there needs to be evidence of intent in addition to the rest of these, um, to fulfilling any of these other criteria. So the question arises, how do you prove this kind of premeditation? While it's unfortunate, that's one issue that the Shia don't have to worry about. There's plenty of clear evidence in the form of videos and print media that espouses this rationalization that tries to justify the elimination of the Shia. Whether it's in a 56 page issue of Debiq, which is ISIS's, mag ISIS's magazine that highlights the rewards of killing the Shia and their goal to eradicate them, or a Saudi cleric who serves in the Ministry of Education who calls Shias rats and vermin, the patterns of violence experienced by the Shia matches these declarations of intent. And one of the key findings that I found after having spoken to each of these stakeholder groups, um, and especially the average Shia citizens who like live in um, states where anti-Shia violence and just anti-Shiaism in general um, is, is highly underreported, specifically the monarchical Gulf states. Um, and that among, these, among this group of stakeholders, it's the absence of a consensus and not the absence of violence that is the main obstacle in the way of this narrative gaining traction. And, um, something, and something that I found that is quite concerning is that instead of overwhelming allyship, there's been a rise of denial and the emergency of this reactionary counter movement that seeks to discredit the emergence of this, of this Shia genocide framing and you know, framing this violence as genocide by bringing up the tragic and oppressive plight of the Rohingya or Uyghur Muslims or any other group of Muslims. And instead they call that Sunni genocide without taking into account that in these cases, it doesn't matter to the oppressors whether the victims are Shia or Sunni. Whereas with anti-Shia violence, it's the specific targeting of the Shia identity in particular. So framing is key. And it's not that anyone's trying to say one form of suffering is greater than another. It's a matter of how framing can have a direct impact on how an issue is viewed. And as a result, the policy prescriptions that are then made. Like when we look at Yemen, for example, which has been referred to by countless UN officials, I think including the Secretary General, as the worst humanitarian crisis of our generation, it doesn't really seem to matter whether the victims are Sunni or Shia. Many of us have seen those ads um, before YouTube videos uh, where you ask for donations where you, know, you can help alleviate the food insecurity and the starvation that's currently underway. Um, but they don't really make mention of the fact that how a significant portion of that population that's affected are in fact Shia. What it comes down to um, is that people should be able to talk about Shia genocide in the same way activists for any other cause would be able to, with the most fitting and accurate framework available. From the most recent wave of anti-Shia violence and protests in Pakistan, to the conflict-related sexual violence experienced by Shia Turkmen, Turkmen women and girls in, in Iraq, to the attack on that maternity ward only this past spring in a Shia neighborhood in Kabul, the closer we get to removing the misunderstanding that prevents the empowerment of this narrative, the more likely that we can prevent these injustices from happening in the first place. The point of these teachings is for them to ultimately become obsolete. And to conclude, here are some resources for further reading accompanied by a quote from one of my interviews that I conducted that stuck with me ever since. Thank you again all so much for your attention and I really hope that this was informative. Thank you so much, Medina. Um, before we get to the number of questions that we've received, I just want to also highlight some points that you made that are so important. And that's first and foremost, that terminology and frameworking matters. So when we discuss this as, when we discuss uh, anti-Shiaism and Shia genocide as sectarian conflict, that really undermines what's going on at play. Um, we see, for example, many Muslim activists, rightfully so, uh, critique the framing of the Israeli-Palestine conflict because it's accepted that um, that's an unbalanced issue with Palestinians especially being targeted. Why are we not doing the same when it comes to anti-Shia and anti-Shiism and Shia genocide? So I thank you very much for uh, highlighting that. And then also the, uh, the aspect of understanding how we need to decolonize our minds when we discuss, for example, sectarianism, when, uh, you know, a sect has very uh, different implications than what 
Shias and Sunnis believe. Again, we highlighted earlier how Shias and Sunnis, as Hidaya mentioned, follow the very, very similar doctrines and principles of Islam. So we need to be very careful how we frame these uh, subjects. Um, so now I just wanna move on for about the last 10 minutes to uh, answer some questions if that's okay with our panelists. Uh, we have a few from both our Facebook Live and our Zoom Q&A. Um, and our first one, I think this one could be uh, thrown to Hidayah first. And of course, if any other panelists can share as well, that would be wonderful. What tangible actions should Muslim scholars and us as individuals take to dismantle anti-Shiism? Um, I think first of all, there's a lot of um, misinformation. Um, we even, you know, I, I hate to even say this, but a lot of the, the leaders of entire centers don't know what Shias believe, right? It's kind of like, um, you know, uh, the bulk of my family is not Shia, right? And so if I ask a question that they don't know the answer to, the answer is, well, the prophet said, and I'm like, well, how do we know that? What, what book is it in? Um, you know, who, who told you that? Um, for instance, somebody, <laughs> Uh, somebody told me just a couple of days ago, like the prophet said, we can't make friends with non-Muslims. And I'm like, what, you know, <laughs> where? Um, so I, I think that the first thing that needs to happen is an acknowledgement that we don't know, right? Um, and, and then to make an effort to go find out, you know, go talk to um, bridge the line of communication between the Sunni scholars and the Shia scholars. Historically, this has never been a problem, right? As I mentioned before, the teacher of all four of the founders of the Sunni, the major Sunni Islamic schools of jurisprudence is our Imam, right? The sixth Imam of the Shia. So there's precedent for this. This is only in the last, you know, um, few years, I'm going to say few in the grand scheme of, of life, really. But yeah, it's only recently that this kind of divide has, has become more apparent. So yeah, I would just say in this instance, anyway, go back to, to what was working before. Thank you so much, Hadaya. And just to add to that last point you made, not only historically in the early uh, years of Islam have scholars worked together, but even in the contemporary age, for example, Sheikh Khalid Abu al-Fadr of the Sufi Institute has worked tremendously with uh, uh, scholars from different backgrounds. So that's something that we need to remember and understand that that's, that's normal and that should be expected. So thank you so much. And also, if I may jump in as well, just tangibly invite Shia speakers, invite a Shia absolutely. to lead the prayer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I live in the DC area, sorry to interrupt you, Ramin, but I live um, in DC, as you mentioned, and um, Howard University is a huge, you know, um, university in DC, it's a historically black college, and this last year was the first time that that MSA had a Shia speaker, for the first time, <laughs> in the history of like all the Muslims that have ever attended um, Howard University, this Past year was the first time um, they had a Shia speaker. Why? You know, and, and it's not like our, you know, the, the Shia scholars and speakers are going to come on and talk about like the most controversial things that we all disagree on, right? We would never do that. Um, there's an acknowledgement that it's there, but our scholars are aware and they know how to pick the topics that are relevant you know, um, to the audience that they're in front of. So yeah, I think that's absolutely. Absolutely. And just to add to that one more time as well, I know, Lukman, we've, we've uh, discussed this before, but, you know, sometimes it's framed as Sunni allyship to the Shia community, but we need to acknowledge we're part of the same community. You know, it, 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 if the way that we address this is, oh, we need to have Sunni allyship with Shias, then, then we should step back and acknowledge okay, how am I framing Shias if I need to be an ally with them? Actually, we're from the same community. Uh, Lukman, if you want to add to that as well. Right. No, I don't have anything to add to that except for um, a quote. And um, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's by Ayatollah Sistani, where he says, where he told people, don't even call 
uh, he was telling a group of Shia members, don't call them Sunni brothers and sisters. They are members of the same person. They're members of the same heart. And I think that's an ethos we need to embrace. Um, really, it, there's not, yes, there are disagreements in theology. Yes, there are major disagreements, but really this, 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 you know, separation, if we keep on, if we keep on referring to ourselves as so separate that there's no, um, you know, reconciliation or like togetherness, then truly what are we doing? So yeah, no, I love that. Yeah, it's not about Sunni allyship. It's really about taking ownership for um, our own actions and holding ourselves accountable. That's it. Definitely. And if I could just add on to that, um, it, it's, uh, I think the quote exactly um, is, do not call Sunnis your, um, our brothers and sisters, rather call them your own selves. Mm. Love them as much as your own self. So, yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing. And uh, really fast, I, I, I see we just got a question kind of adding to this um, that we can tackle pretty fast. Should MSAs focus on centering Shia voices when trying to dismantle anti-Shiism or should they try to have a Sunni scholar speak about it? Oh, anybody else want this one? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I guess I can start and look more if you want to add on. I think, um, I mean, I think this panel is a pretty good example. I don't know. But, um, you know, having that a combination, right? Having that kind of collaboration, that exchange of ideas, how do you think this would best be structured? Also taking in the specific, like, demographic, like, who's going to be attending this event? You know what I mean? It's going to be more recently. Maybe it'll be ha helpful to have, like, a more familiar face, kind of ease, ease into the conversation. Um, especially if it's uh, it's something that's that is kind of new and hasn't been done before. Um, but yeah, I think Lukman, if you want to add on anything onto that. Yeah, um, you know, this is something that you know we've we've done um, in my time on the e board of Brown Muslim Student Association. Um, you need you need to have both. We utilize the chaplain to um, who was a Sunni to underscore the similarities and and in addition. We brought uh, Shia speakers like um, Sheikh Fayaz Jafar, Sheikh Trenton Carl, um, to do Shia programming for us, to, to, to do Arba'in, to expose us to those things and to provide program for Shia students. It's definitely a mix. Um, and you definitely need, it's, 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 a it's a cooperative effort. And yeah, we, both, we, be, we need both um, systems of knowledge and both uh, knowledgeable people on both sides to um, heal this divide, inshallah. Absolutely, thank you so much. I'm gonna move on to the next question. Um, what are some ways to ensure Sunni and Shia identities are not exploited by nationalistic tendencies? I ask this as an Iraqi American Muslima from both Sunni and Shia families. I think Medina, if you wanna um, touch on this first. I think sure, I'll definitely. Um, I think understanding it in terms of transnational communities as well as kind of like you know the intersectionality of where your your identity itself kind of lies um so i think in terms of especially dismantling anti-shiism you know especially like in the more extreme cases of violence and things like that it cannot be a, simply a case of pakistani shias are going to show up for pakistani shias when anti-shia violence happens or you know, when Hassan Shahada was, you know, killed, it cannot be just Iraqi Shias are going to show up just for Iraqi Shias. It's recognizing that because it, it really is just pigeonholing ourselves over and over and over again um, to the point where who else do we have if it's just ourselves? Um, so I think recognizing the transnationality of, of your identities and, you know, the the broadness of how of how far your community spans and all the resources that are available at your disposal if we just take the time to kind of venture out of our bubbles. And I know it sounds kind of elementary, but you'd be surprised how many Shia communities exist without ever communicating with one another um, or even ever collaborating. So I think maybe that'd be, be a good place to start, start, start building coalitions. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, I'm just gonna move on to our final question. So um, as we're approaching the end, from an Islamic perspective, why is it crucial for us to act to prevent sectarian violence around the world? And I'll let whoever would like to start tackle that one. Um, I don't think that we need the Islamic perspective on this. Um, it, to be very honest with you, this is a human um, effort, right? Genocide of anyone is wrong. I don't need the prophet to tell me that. I don't need the Quran to tell me that. This is a physically thing um, that we know 
uh, needs to be combated. These are human lives, right? This is not, um, you know, in a, in a on a very basic level, it's not about, um, you know, it, it's not about, oh, I need to prevent this because it's genocide. Genocide of anyone. The word genocide should not exist in our vocabulary, right, of, of any group. So I think that the, the framing of that question, and I'm not saying this to like belittle the person who asked it, it's a great question, but I'm saying even the framing um, of the question and thinking about it in that way is a part of the problem, right? So this is where we kind of need to work backwards in order to stop um, you know, in order to, to stop this from getting to the point where it's like, why is it important for me to do that? Well, it's important to do it because these are people, right? And tomorrow that could be you, <laughs> you know, la uh, samahallah, right? Um, uh, I'm forgetting the quote directly, but there's a quote that says, you know, this person is, this group was being persecuted and I didn't do anything. And this person is being persecuted and I didn't do anything. And then when I was being persecuted, there was no one there to, to defend or to help me. And that this is very much the direction that we're headed in if we don't fix this problem. Absolutely. Well, on that note, I just want to sincerely thank each and every one of you, Hedaya, Medina, and Lukman for this incredibly informative and much needed discussion. Inshallah, you all can continue to inspire for peace and inspire these conversations to really um, um, escalate and continue on, on a national scale. Um, I do wanna point out, I do see that we have a number of questions that we weren't able to get to, but if you would like to email me at ramin at mpac.org. I'd be more than happy to share this with my pan uh, with the panelists to answer. Um, I also want to point out that our panelists are full of some incredible resources. I know Medina has just an incredible Goodreads where she has so many books on this subject and on many other ones as well that you all can contact. Of course, Hidayah has so many experiences as well that she can share and Lukma, same with Lukman as well. So I want to thank each and every one of you for speaking tonight. And I want to thank everyone who was able to attend this program and to all those who are watching the recording. I hope you enjoy this program and inshallah, we can all continue in this effort. Assalamu alaikum everyone.